What I want to do this evening, uh, for just the first part, because I know this is only going to take about 10 minutes, but it's just going to be the precursor. I want to tell you one of the, the things I, I do within my workshop called Singing with the Spirit, and it's the, it's the seven reasons why we should sing. Someone asked me this morning, are you going to talk about a singing a cappella? And I do that in my seminar, but that one is called Why I Choose a Cappella. And that's a, that's a different one, but maybe I'll do that for you uh, on another evening sometime. But tonight, I want us to look at this, the reasons why, and just seven of them, why. So before we break, so the kids can go to their classes, I want to encourage you to get your Bibles and turn to these two passages. Uh, you've seen these before. Uh, we reference them many times when it comes to our, uh, to our singing. Because what Paul wrote to the church in, uh, in Ephesus and the church in Colossae is almost, in these two verses, almost uh, parallel. Uh, I'll take you first to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. And there's actually more that I would say about verse 18 and, and the context. Uh, but for, this, for the sake of this, I just want you to see verse 19. He says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now, there's something you need to catch here, and we're going to read Colossians in a moment. But you need to see, he says, speak to each other. That means that's vocal. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, if you want to hold on to Ephesians, you can. But turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says this, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another. How, Paul? With psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So what I would ask you, and this is one of the things that I bring up to the congregation when I visit with him about this, is Paul saying, I want you to sing. I really want you to sing. Make sure that you're singing. Or he's saying, I want you to sing psalms. And then I want you to also sing hymns. And while you're at it, sing some spiritual songs. Is he giving us the same thing three times for emphasis? Or is he giving us three different styles of singing? Ladies and gentlemen, it's my opinion that he's given us three different styles of singing. And they are psalms, which come straight from the text. Example. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Comes from where? Psalm 23. How about this? the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases? Comes from the book of Lamentations. It's scripture. It's verbatim scripture. We even talked a little bit this morning about the um, um, uh, come, uh, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. It comes straight from the song. We sing that in the song book. It comes straight from scripture. If we sing text, we're singing a song. But what is a hymn? Well, we got a hymnal, so those are all hymns, right? Well, yes, but no. A hymn, the way I look at it and the way other people much smarter than me look at it, is a hymn is a song that I sing, are you ready for this? To him. My Jesus, I love thee. I know that you are mine. That's not a song I'm singing to you. It's not a song that I'm, hopefully it's encouraging you, that I'm singing directly to my God. I need thee every hour. is not a song I sing to my wife. I do want to be with her, but I'm not saying I need you every hour. Sometimes she doesn't want to be around me some hours. That's a song I'm singing to my God. I need you. That would be a hymn. A song that I sing to him. Well, what's a spiritual song? Well, a spiritual song would be a song that we sing to each other. Like this one. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cable strain, will your anchor drift or will you remain firm? That would be a song that we sing that is to each other. It's a, when we sing songs of edification. Come, ye that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. We're marching to Zion. When we sing to admonish and encourage each other, then we're singing Spiritual songs. What we will do this evening for worship, and we're going to break in just a moment, um, so the kids are going to do classes. We want to focus on the hymns. And we're not going to do a bunch of hymns, but we want to focus on him. And before we do that, I want to ask this question, and then we're going to take a quick break. 
Why is it that we sing in the first place? Why do we do this? Now, part of what I like to talk about in these seminars is why do we sing a cappella? Why do we do it like we do this way? There is no band, there's no guitar, there's no organ. It's just our voices. Why do we choose to do that? Ladies and gentlemen, we have to be able to answer that question, especially for our kids. Because they're going to wonder, because they're already going to people's school, and they see, they see their peers that this morning, they were in a worship setting that had a big band. Some of them had fog machines. And whoa, it's exciting. Why don't we do anything like that? Why do we sing like we sing? We've got to answer those questions. Because we live in a world of entertainment. I want to be entertained. And you know this is true, but it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, there was a day, and some of you remember this, when, um, when you turn on the TV show and there was a show called The Gong Show. You remember that one? And what happened if you were not very good in The Gong Show? Bong, and you're escorted off. Actually, it pulled you off. It, it was, if you're not good enough, you don't get to go. That was then, but you know they still do it today. It's called The Voice. And if you're good... If you're a good singer, then you can stay. If you're not a good singer, you can go ahead and go. Matter of fact, sometimes it's almost comical. And I don't speak from experience because I've never watched the show. There's also things like America's Got Talent or American Idol. And I don't, I don't choose to go with those because that does something about the competition that I don't think God intended when he gave us voices. I don't think he did. I think he gave us the opportunity to sing for his glory, not for our own but, you know, we make it entertainment. We do. If they're, if they're good singers, ooh, who's that masked singer? That's going to be kind of fun. And you may like some of those shows, and I'm not saying that you're bad for doing that. I just choose not to do that. Because when I sing, as rugged and as terrible as my voice is, I want to sing to my God. And if I can encourage my brothers and sisters along the way, then I'll do it. If I can raise my kids and sing to the babies, and I hope moms and dads, you do that with your children or grandchildren, sing to them because God gave you that voice. And it doesn't matter if you have a good or a bad voice. Get this. It doesn't matter how you sing. What matters is that you sing to your God. So let's look at seven reasons why we sing, but we'll do that as soon as, uh, as soon as we let the kids break. Let's take a quick prayer and then we'll let the, the kids go to their class and we'll sing one more song. Father, thank you so much for the blessings of this day and for the time we have to, together here. I pray that these next few minutes that we study together will be a glory to you, will be, an honor, will be an honor of your name. Take our children as they go and study more in detail, Father. Let them grow. Let them grow deeper into the, the knowledge of your will for them. And let us, Father, as the adults, be able to pattern for them a life of Jesus Christ. Bless us this hour. May your name be glorified is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. So why should we sing? What's the, um, what's the big deal about that anyway? Because, you know, there's a lot of people who have got a lot better voices than me, so maybe I shouldn't have to worry about this. I want to give you seven what I call reasons why we should. And I'm going to go ahead because I like to do this as more for fun than anything else. I like to try to give this in, in, a, uh, in an order that makes it a little bit more enticing, perhaps, for you. We're going to start with number seven. But, you know, quite honestly, there are some people saying, I don't get it. I don't know why we got to do this. Because, and, and quite honestly, some folks say, I, I'm not going to do it. You go ahead and sing, but uh, uh, all that uh, uh, sweet is the tender love Jesus has shown. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to go that direction. Besides, that, I'm very so I'm not going to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, I really don't think we can do that. I don't think we can take that route. And here's the reason why. Because when we sing, number seven is we obey. Did you realize that? Did you know it's not just a matter of saying, well, this is what the elders say, so we've got to sing a song now. No, we do this because we want to obey what God has told us to do. It's scripture. It's not an option. It's not something I can say, well, I don't have a very good voice. Uh, it's not, I don't feel like it. Now, I know that there are folks who get to the point their voice is not strong and they can't. And they don't have that. And that's understandable. But ladies and gentlemen, that is for us. When we sing, all of us should be singing with this. And if you're not singing with your heart, 
I think you're missing the point. I think we get caught into a spot where we try to make it too much about us and not about God. You see, it's a command when God says sing. So I think I better take a look at what, uh, what Ephesians says. Because when I see Colossians and Ephesians, which we've already read, God's not just saying, would you do it? The scripture does not say, if you feel like it, sing. Colossians and Ephesians, both of them do not say, if you're good at it, sing and make million in your hearts. That's not a qualifier. It's very simply, sing. And if I had the time, I would take you to the Greek word, which is solo, and what that means. But I save that for, I'll save that for another time. But it's important for us to understand that when we sing, ladies and gentlemen, we are obeying our God. Number six, when we sing, I like this, we dig deep roots. We dig deep roots into God's word. Have you thought about that? I, I think it's interesting to understand, to, to, to consider the fact that C.J. Mahaney calls church singing take-home theology. Well, what does that mean? Take-home theology. Well, theology is scripture. It's Bible. Church singing is take-home Bible. How so? Because sometimes we sing scripture. Sometimes we sing songs that remind us of heaven. Walking alone at eve and viewing the skies afar. Bidding the darkness come. That means letting... Come on, I'm ready for the end of life. Did you realize that's what we're saying? Bidding, come on. How about this one? Some glad morning, some glad morning when this life is over, I'm going to die. That's what we sing. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. I'll fly away. When I die, what's the next line in the chorus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's take-home theology. I can take that with me. People in the world do not sing that. Die? Are you kidding me? No, I want to live as long as I can. I'm not ready for this. So when we understand that when we dig deep roots in our songs, we're taking some theology with us in our songs. I like this statement too. You see, our singing is like a three-minute devotional. Have you ever thought about that? I'm going to, I'm going to find this real quick. Uh, I, I don't often do this, and I don't know if you know this in the book. It's, um, I don't have my glasses, so there they are. Couldn't even see it if I did. Here we go. It's a song that I did not know probably about, uh, about 10 years ago. Never heard it before. And it was introduced to me at one of the nursing homes that we sang in Dallas, and I really fell in love with it. And it's not a, it's not a, a new song. It's an older one. It's got... Uh, it's got uh, Close to 100 years, uh, well, the music's over 100 years old. Well, yeah, the words are too, 1800s. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He, God, whose heart is kind beyond all measure, gives unto each day what he determines is best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil, work, with peace and rest. That's, that's a song that uh, I've just memorized. It's a three-minute devotional, but it brings me strength. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when we take these songs and we make them a part of our life, when we make them a part of our day, it gives us the strength to take the theology with us where we are. Clear and practical applications that you can use in your life throughout your week. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. And these are just some that are coming off the top of my head. You've got them in your mind right now, too. You've got them in your mind right now. If you don't, and, I, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to be honoring. I'm just going to be honoring with you. If you don't have songs already in the back of your head, start to get to know your number two favorite book. Start, start to spend some time in here. Start looking at it and check to see, is this song, we sang the old rugged cross. Is that a very biblical song? Should I be talking about the old rugged cross? Realize our songs are poetry. And so be careful that you don't get too bent out of shape on them. But also realize that when we find that it is scripture and when we find that it brings us closer to our God, that's our objective. You know, 
one song, and I, and I talk about this in, in one of the sessions in my class, L.O. Sanderson and uh, Tio uh, uh, Chisholm uh, wrote a song called um, Be With Me, Lord, I Cannot Live Without Thee. And when you look at the history behind that, it's an incredible song, but if the, the purpose of that song is a prayer. It's a song that I sing to my God. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without thee. I don't even dare to take one step without you because I can't do this without you. It's take-home theology. It helps me to dig deep roots into God's word. Another reason why we sing, number, when we sing, ladies and gentlemen, this is scripture, we build each other up. Did you realize that? When you're singing, and you're hearing your brother and sister singing, that should give you encouragement. Now, here's the flip side of it. If you're choosing not to sing, then you're not building your brothers and sisters up. You see, I've got a responsibility. I can't opt out because I want to be able to build my brothers and sisters up. Take your Bibles and turn to Colossians again. We're going to look at this because this is a little hard to see. Colossians chapter 3. I want you to see what Paul is saying here. When we sing, we build each other up. You know Colossians 3.16. We've already looked at that. But take a look. I'm going to back up a little bit further, probably into verse 12. He's talking to us about putting on a new self, putting on a new life, making sure that the life that we live uh, is for Christ. So as those who have been chosen of God, that's you and I, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, and patience. Kind of sounds like the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? And then he says in verse 13, bear with one another, forgive one another. If you've got an argument or a complaint with, with each other, go to them and talk to each other. Don't backbite. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've got a problem with your brother and sister, we're told right here what to do. Bear with each other. Forgive each other. If we fail to do that, we are not building each other up. And then we're just going through the motions. When I was a kid, well, the kids are all gone now, but when I was a little kid, I was going to point one out and share, give you an example of the age. Our cousins would all come together at the summertime. Did you all do that? All the families come together for, for a few days and, and all, the grand, all the kids or grandkids as the cousins, we'd all get together and, and we would play together. And there may be five, six, eight to 10, 15 of us. And in our play, we would play cowboys and Indians. We'd play cops and robbers. We'd play school. I don't know why we would do that in summertime, but we did. But you know what else what we did? We played church. We played church. And we'd all gather together there, and, and one of the guys would, would be the preacher, and he would take the Bible and read, and, and one of the guys would lead a prayer, and, and, uh, and they always told me to lead the singing. I don't know why, probably because I was just the loudest one. But we would, we would play church, and we would even go to the kitchen and get the saltine crackers and some grape juice, and we'd have Lord's Supper. We didn't do it right, but we thought we were, because we were playing. One thing we didn't do is we never took up a collection. That's good to know we want to get rid of their allowance. That's mine. But we would play church. Ladies and gentlemen, I wonder if today some of us aren't still playing church. We come in, we do all the right things. There's a preacher and there's a song. We're singing our songs. And, and then we read some scripture and we say a prayer. Or we even take the Lord's Supper and we do it the right way. We do it the right way, unleavened bread. And we actually give. But then we go outside and play Cowboys and Indians. We go outside and we play school. We go outside and we play cops and robbers. And then we come back again next week and we play church again. See, if we're not careful, we'll get into a routine that this is just one of the things that we do. And that's not, that's not what Christ died for. He died so that you and I would give our lives. And when we do go outside to, to go to school, when we do go outside to do our jobs, whether that's in the police force or the, or the work or whatever it might be, I go out there and I'm exuding Jesus Christ. And I'm looking forward to when I can come back to be with my family again. Not to play church, but to be built up. To build each other up. Because I know that when we're singing, I'm digging those deep roots 
into Scripture. And I'm going to run back to this because we lost it. Let's see if I can find it real quick. I wonder if it's my clicker. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But we bear with one another. We forgive one another. We put on love. We have peace united with one another. We teach God's Word. And we do all that through singing. Singing together as a church family. We hear hundreds of voices, hundreds of confessions. Granted, we're, we're not quite a hundred in this assembly. At least, not more than a hundred. But dozens of voices that come together to sing. Do we do that? Do we sing to each other? Or is that just one of the things that we could do the routine? We must encourage each other all the more as we see the day drawing near. Number four. Why do we sing? Because, yes, we're, we're obeying. And yes, we're building each other up. And we're digging deep roots. But did you realize when you sing, you're making war with Satan? Had you ever thought about that before? Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against the forces of evil. It's against the forces of darkness. And when we sing, we're taking the battle to the devil. And, and you know this because we've done this throughout our history. And, and, and you can go back to our Civil War time. You can go back to, to any of the war times. And they had battle songs. There was one, it's actually, it's not, it's, the battle song's not in our book, but it is a battle song. In heavenly armor we enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. There's one there, I don't know if you know it, it's called, um, Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high. That's the flag for the Lord. Gird your armor on, stand firm, everyone. You see, that's a song of battle. And it actually comes from the Civil War times. And we'll rally around the flag, boys, rally once again, shouting the battle cry of freedom. You see, we sing songs in wartime to encourage each other. Let's go fight. Don't give up. Don't quit. We sing to encourage each other in this battle because it is a battle. And we want to make sure that we're not, we're, you're not going to go out there on your own. And so we sing and say, soldiers of Christ, let's put our armor on. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers, arise and press the battle before the night covers up the skies. You see, our songs are full of this. It's a theme that's visible in Scripture. It's a theme that we can see. And the Bible teaches us to love and have peace, offer forgiveness, teach others, and to sing. I wonder if there's a posture that's more hated by the evil one than the posture of a believer who is singing heartfelt songs of praise to his God. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. I will not want because God's with me. I don't think the devil enjoys that too much. I'm almost certain he doesn't. You know, the Bible teaches us attitudes and habits that will wage war on sin. And so we sing about those. And I like this phrase. This is one that, uh, that I thought was pretty interesting to say. Try to lie. Try to be greedy. Try to look at something that's inappropriate. And at the same time, sing and make melody in your heart to God. I don't know if you can do it. I know you can't do it and be pleasing to him. And if it's heartfelt, you cannot do it. So we sing. And when we sing, number four, we make battle with the evil one. Number three, when we string is, sing, it's very similar to, by, to encouraging one another. It strengthens ourselves and others for trials. Do you think we'll ever get through this life and not have a day of trial? It doesn't seem like it. Sometimes it's day after day and almost hour after hour. And how do I get through this? What I like to do is I like to sing. Because I find my strength in, my, in song. Take Paul and Silas, for example. Do you remember what happened in Acts chapter 16? If you want to take your Bibles and turn there, we're going to look at that real quickly. You know this situation. Paul and Silas have been, been talking about Christ. And they've been beat for it. Verse 22, the crowd rose up against them and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. There's a difference between being beaten with a whip and being beaten with a rod. A whip, a whip can do some damage. It can rip skin. Do you know what a rod does? It breaks bones. 
a rod bruises more than severely. The damage of a rod is what Paul and Silas experienced. Verse 23 of Acts chapter 16. And when they struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And having received such a command, he threw them in the inner prison and fastened, fastened their feet in the stocks. I want to make sure that they're not going anywhere. Not just on the outer part of the prison. I'm putting them deep inside the jailer and Philippi did. And here's our point of singing to strengthen each other. Verse 25. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Now that alone is encouraging to me. The simple fact that they've been beat, you've got to know they're hurting. Their feet are in, in, in they're, not just, they're not just chained up, they're in, they're in stocks. That's not a very comfortable position. But also, you know what? I don't think they had any guitars either with them. They were singing. This was all vocal. But finish this verse. They were singing hymns and praises to God and the prisoners were listening to them. They weren't sleeping. They weren't going, oh, I wish these guys would shut up. They were listening. What are these guys doing? These men have just been beaten with an inch of their life. And now what are they doing? In their suffering, they're singing. And they're glorifying God. What an incredible example. What an incredible example. Well, I don't want to sing because I don't have a very good voice and somebody might look at me funny. I don't think Paul and Silas cared about that. Paul and Silas realized that even in their suffering, they could build others up and themselves up. And that's exactly what they did. And you read on, you know what happened with that. Number two, we're counting down to the number one. The number two reason we should sing is when we do, we walk a, a God-designed path for joy. Did you realize that? You know that God wants us. You know that God wants you to follow him. You know that we've got, we've, got a, we've got a design right here that tells us how to do it. And God didn't just put us on this world, spin the globe and say, go get him. He wants us to follow him. The question is, is do we want to follow him? You see... With God's perfect design and his understanding of our condition, of the human condition, he combined joy and singing for us. It's not a competition, ladies and gentlemen. Let me say that again. It is not a competition when we sing. And yet we do that so many times, and you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> it may be the song leader. And, and I don't know about you, but I've been in the spot where I sit, where you're sitting and go, oh no, he's coming up to lead singing this morning? Oh boy. Is it just me? Or <clears throat> That's not right. I shouldn't do that. I should not do that because now the focus is on him and not on him. So I've got to keep myself in check that way. But I also sat there going, boy, she is singing so loud. Ah, oh, brother. See, that's not my call either because I can't see her heart. So when I sing, I want to make sure my focus is on my God. God gave us that. He gave us that. So I would say to you, do you struggle for joy? Are you having a hard time finding joy in life? I'd encourage you to sing. Use your number two book. Start spend some time in there. Look at it. Sing songs. Read them. Learn the poetry. Are you already happy? Do you already feel good? Then sing. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Do you sing? Because you're happy, do you sing for you're joyful? I'd encourage us to consider that. We've already looked at, uh, at six of them. So as we sing, you understand, ladies and gentlemen, that it captures our senses. The ability that God has given to us is unlike anything else in this world. If you don't believe that, take a look at God's creation. Well, Myron, the birds sing. Yeah, they do. Take one bird and put him on a windowsill and he sings and he's, I don't know what he's singing about. He may, be, he may be hungry. He may be looking for a mate. He may be sorrowful. He may be happy. May, I have no idea, but he's chirping along. But you take a whole bunch of those birds and put them in a tree and what do you have? 
besides a mess on your car. You got a racket. Have you ever listened to a bunch of birds in the tree? And it's like, what in the world are they doing? But you take one voice of ours and you sing by yourself. It doesn't matter if you're good or bad because that's not a qualifier, remember? But then you take a whole congregation of God's people and we all start to sing. And ladies and gentlemen, if it's from our hearts, it's not a racket. God looks at it as a sweet aroma. But that's up to us. We've got to use it and focus our voices towards him. We talked about obedience. We talked about the fact that when we sing, it's rooted deep in the word. It helps us to build each other up. It helps us to endure, to carry on, to be able to make war against Satan, to be able to find joy in our singing. The Christian's goal, yours and mine, our goal in this life, and the purpose that we have is the number one reason why we sing. Okay, Myron, what is that number one reason? Our number one reason is to bring glory to God. So let's look at this real quickly. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, when I consider, did I just go backward on that? I think I did. Let's see if I can get there again. When I consider my number one reason for singing, why do I do it? Why do I do this? It's quite simply because when we sing, when you and I sing, we are glorifying our God. We do. If our heart is right, and if our focus is on the king, when we sing, we bring him glory. I want to take you to the Bible again. Take a look at the book of Revelation. We talked a little bit about this in the singing class, in that early bird singing. I also like to call it... Um, uh, and I'd encourage you, I know, that, I know that Richard used to do this, but let me encourage you to get back to those singing classes. Your worship starts at 5, Bible class starts at 5. Start at 4 o'clock or 4.15. And I would encourage you to call it, you can, you can take this, it's not copyrighted, call it the 4x4 four four singing. 4x4. Four four. And that means on the 4th Sunday, which this wasn't the 4th Sunday, but at least it's once a month. On the 4th Sunday at 4 o'clock, come together and sing four-part harmony. Learn it. Practice it. You've got song leaders, you've got talented men that can help you do that. Ladies, I've heard some of your alto and your soprano voices. Come together and sing for God's glory. Four by four singing. I'd encourage you to get that and bring that. Revelation chapter 7, as we talked about in our singing class, we referenced a song that you all know very well. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host, a great big crowd of folks, and they're all redeemed by the blood, and they're singing to God. Look at Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to begin in verse 9. This is, this is scripture, folks. This is what John, the apostle, saw in his vision, in his revelation. And after these things, I looked, and behold, John said, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues were standing before the throne, before the Lamb, and they're clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. Are you getting the image? Do you see what, what John is seeing? This is a picture of heaven. And they, crowd out, they cried out with a loud voice, and this is what John wrote. This is what he heard them say. He heard them say, and I just must have hit the wrong button again. There we go. Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. I'm going to hop past verse 11. You can read it right there. And all the angels around the throne and uh, the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. And they were saying this, verse 12. Amen. Or even so. Or may it be. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength or might. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is actually, remember I said that we sing psalms, hymns, and spirit. This is a, hymn, a psalm. And we're going to sing, I'm going to introduce it to you. You may already know this one, but if you don't, I want you to catch this one. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor, power, and strength. That belongs to our God. 
That's what they sing around the throne. At least that's what John wrote down. I look forward to the day that we can stand before the throne and sing. But ladies and gentlemen, just like we said, I heard the song and strove to join, we can sing today. God expects us to. He asks us to. He tells us this is what you need to do. The reason I put that nine times up there is so that we don't miss something here. How many know this song, Salvation Belongs to Our God? Does anybody know this one? One, two, both of you have to join with me then. Three, good. We can almost do a quartet then. You, you, I, we're going to take some time and I'm going to teach it to you. you. You may not have raised your hand, but by the time we leave, you're going to be able to sing this one. And maybe you can add this to your repertoire. Because this is scripture. But the reason I put nine times is for this. In the chorus, we sing this part. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And when we sing this, and the reason I like to bring this up is when I first learned this one, it was like, be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God. And I'm like, that's kind of nice, but what, what be to our God? Salvation. Salvation belongs to our, salvation belongs to our God. But we've got to catch this. Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessings and glory and wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Ladies and gentlemen, that belongs to our God. There's no glory here. There's no thanks here. There's no power or wisdom or strength. Not here. Not here. Only here. And that's why I say, that belongs to my God forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and uh, take you through the verse, first verse. Now, you've already heard the chorus, and I'll, I'll help you with that again. But I want you to hear it. Don't worry about the parts. I've given you a four-part harmony on that. But just follow me. Since you're, this is new to you, just sing with me, and you'll catch it. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne. And unto the Lamb be praise and glory Wisdom and thanks. Then musically, it's going to go up high. Honor and power and strength be to our God. So let's try that one. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne. Come back, let's do it again. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne. One more time. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne. Keep going. And unto the Lamb be praise and glory wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Okay, let's come back and do it again. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Let's keep singing. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. We're going to go back and look at that again and practice that, but I want you to see the second verse. It doesn't follow Revelation, but what it follows is exactly what we should be following. And we, we, the redeemed, we are the redeemed and we shall be strong. How? In purpose, 
and in unity. We, as God's children, will be strong in what we're set out to do, what our purpose is. And we will be united. And we will declare aloud. That's what we're going to sing in just a moment. And we will declare aloud the seven things that belong to our God. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength belongs to our God forever and ever. Amen? Let's sing this again. And I'm going to take you back to the, to the verse again. And then we'll just keep flowing right into, right into the course. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks Honor, power, and strength be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And we the redeemed shall be strong in purpose and in unity. Declaring aloud praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. That would be considered a psalm. Because you just sang, for all practical purposes, the words that John wrote. And did you catch what you just sang? You sang the same thing that John heard sung around the throne. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne. And to the Lamb, be praised and glory, wisdom, and thanks, honor, and power, and strength belongs to our God forever and ever. Amen. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when we have an opportunity to sing, when we consider the fact that God has given us something that nothing else in his creation has, yes, the birds sing. Even the whales, I understand, sing, though I've never heard them. And I'm sure that other parts of God's creation make noises that we could classify as praising him. And indeed, I think they, they do. Because the scripture says, if we fail to sing out, the rocks will. The rocks will cry out. God's creation speaks. If we don't do it, his creation is going to. Ladies and gentlemen, we must. We cannot sit back and refuse to sing on the petty assumption that I don't have a good voice. Or on the the idiotic belief that I just don't want to do that. We don't have an option. Why we sing? Because God told us to. And it's not about me. See, when I can get to that point and I realize it's not about me, then I can sing and it doesn't matter what happens. Well, what if I, my voice cracks? To God be the glory. What if I sing the wrong notes, which I do a lot? Smile and give God the glory. What if I forget the words? Study them a little bit better. Know them. Make that number two book more than just words. Because salvation 
belongs to our God. And he gave it to us. Let's sing it one more time. And I'm going to pull back a little bit. I'm not going to sing as much because I want your voices to sing. Guys, can you advance it so I don't have to that way? Would you mind doing that? Let's sing this. And don't forget, we said nine times, be to our God forever and ever. Do not forget what belongs to our God. It's praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Seven things. It's kind of perfect. Seven things belongs to our God. Let's sing it together. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Be to our God forever. Be to our God forever. Be to our God forever. Amen. And we, the redeemed, shall be strong in perfect. And in unity, declaring aloud praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Be Ask you just a moment ago, how many of you know this song? One, two, three hands came up. That was it. Did you hear your voices just now? That's not me. That's you. And that's your God. And that you open your heart and say, I want to sing this to my God. And you just said, wisdom and power and strength, thanksgiving, all of that stuff belongs to you, God, forever. So why do we sing? Ladies and gentlemen, why do we do this? I, I think it's, in my opinion, I think it's pretty clear. You and I sing because of our promise for eternal life. We sing because you and I have salvation. God's given it to us. Now the question is, is how much does it matter to you? Does, is it something that you, you live for this? No pun intended. Is this, the, is this the whole source of your being? I, I look forward to the day that, hallelujah, by and by, I'm going to go home? Or is my focus on getting through this day because i got some more stuff to do tomorrow? How important is your salvation? When you realize that it has eternal consequences, then it will change everything that you do. I hope that this morning and this evening, the little bit of time that uh, we were able to be together has been an encouragement to you. Because that's what my God calls me to do. He calls me to admonish and to, t and to encourage and to teach. And that's what I hope that I've done. But I need you to know this. You've done that for me. And you might say, well, you've never met me. How do you know you admonish me? Because I've looked into your eyes. Because I've seen you sitting here on a sunny night when there's so many other things that you could have been doing. But this is where you chose to be. Why? Because you understand the promise of salvation. 
And I pray that we'll never forget that. And I pray that we will always hold fast as a family because God has given us something that there's nothing else in this creation to compare with. So don't lose it. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm sorry I didn't give you a whole lot of opportunities to talk. And to, I think maybe this should have been more of an engaging class. I apologize I didn't, I didn't frame that up. But hopefully, hopefully you've been admonished and infected in some way. Let's bow and go to our Father in prayer. Father, we bow our heads. But we bow our hearts too. Realizing and understanding your power, your strength, your wisdom, your glory. It all belongs to you, and you, you sent us your son so that we could get a glimpse of that. And you gave us an example to follow in Jesus Christ. And I pray that we will. But right now, Father, I ask that you will be with this congregation that meets at White House that you will take them and that you will strengthen the leadership. So, Father, that they will lead in a way that honors you. Would you please take these, this, these members of this congregation, help them, Father, to see the full extent of your love and your objective for them, that as they walk out of this building, that they will step into this week realizing and seeing ways that they can shine Jesus Christ in their life. And Father, may we sing, not just going through the words, not just uh, doing the routine of our, of our music, but Father, help us to sing with understanding. Help us to see that in these songs, when we obey you as we sing them, Father, we are singing to build each other up, to make war with the evil one, to give ourselves and others strength during our trials. But, Father, we sing so that we can honor you and bring you glory. May we live so that your name is glorified through our songs, through our actions, Father, even through our thoughts. Bless us this night is my prayer in Christ's precious and holy name.